what the buzz is. All right, we will start shortly. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, what a beautiful prayer, the Akathist, and what a great joy to be able to talk about Our, our Lady uh, tonight, the uh, Most Holy Theotokos. Uh, and, I, and I just want to say that it, there's this one line that uh, in the Akathist that, um, that great orators are, are, are rendered mute as fish before your mystery. And I'm no great orator, so... All, all the more do I, I feel unworthy to uh, speak about her and the majesty of her, her great mystery. Uh, it, interestingly, it's Our Lady who drew me here to Our Lady of Redemption. I remember seeing the name of the parish as I was looking into um, Byzantine Catholic churches in Detroit, and I saw Our Lady of Redemption. I had never seen that name of a church, and I thought, oh, what a perfect name for a church, Our Lady of Redemption, because she is the one who gives us the redemption. And, uh, and so uh, it was the church's name that it, it is one of the main reasons that here, here I am before you, and then your beautiful community, of course, and the beauty of the liturgy. But um, so uh, the title of this talk is You Do We Exalt, and you, of course, will recognize this from our liturgy. We say this. Uh, every Sunday during the Divine Liturgy. But the four talks that we're, gonna, uh, that we're going to cover over the next four weeks, we'll be looking at the Theotokos in Doctrine and Devotion. So here's the 30,000-foot overview of the, the four sessions. So uh, today, we're going to talk about Theotokos. What does it mean? Mary's divine maternity. Next week, uh, the, the Greek a parthenos, or ever virgin. We'll talk about what the church teaches about Mary's virginity. Uh, in session three, we'll look at her purity. Uh, we, we heard tonight, all blameless one, right? What does that mean? And what, what, is, um, what is the, dog, the, the doctrine, dogma of her Dormition and Assumption into Heaven. So that's session three. And then session four, thinking about Our Lady of Redemption. What, what is her role in our salvation? I mean, we, we said over and over again in the Akathist hymn, Most Holy Theotokos, save us. So, um, you, you know, th th this is a challenging uh, idea for many evangelical ears, right? And uh, perhaps you've encountered this in your own uh, sharing of the faith with others. So we'll talk about that as well. So looking more specifically at tonight, um, I have a few goals. One is that to, uh, to help grow familiarity with the Marian text in the New Testament. Uh, so if you want to jot down some notes, I, I'll, I'll try to prepare a, a little handout or something for you to take with you in the coming weeks, but unfortunately I don't have anything uh, tonight. But We'll grow familiarity with the Marian texts, um, including those that may come up in apologetic uh, conversations. You, you'll also know more about the meaning, origin, and controversy over the term Theotokos, right? Mother of God. Again, evangelicals will, will oftentimes um, uh, reject that idea. How could it, uh, anyone be God's mother? Uh, but that's a very old controversy that predates them. Also, we're going to uh, understand how the divine maternity, that of course means her uh, motherhood of God, uh, one, grounds everything we believe about Mary 
and uh, two informs all of our liturgical expressions. Right? It's because she is mother of God that, of course, we can speak about any of these other uh, mysteries. Okay, so uh, first things first, let's look at Mary in the, uh, the scriptures, uh, in the Gospels, because of course that's how we first encounter Our Lady, is uh, through the infancy narratives, right? We meet her at Jesus' beginnings. So, interestingly, uh, only, we only have the infancy narratives in two of the Gospels. So, uh, and they're, they're both in what we would call the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, Mark doesn't give us any of the infancy narratives, but uh, Matthew and Luke do. And so Matthew is going to have more of the focus on St. Joseph, and Luke is going to have more of the focus on, uh, on Mary. So, uh, uh, and the angels are all over the place in both of the, uh, the infancy narratives. In Matthew, we have the angels appearing to Joseph many times by dream, just like Joseph in the Old Testament who received the, um, uh, he, he was a great dreamer, right? Uh, same thing with Joseph. The angels come to him and direct him uh, to the protection of Mary and the Christ child. Uh, and there's, of course, where we have the visit of the Magi uh, and the flight into Egypt. Now in Luke, we have two different, what are called angelophanies. So we, we talk about the theophany, Right? The appearance of, of God, the manifestation of God. Well, an angel often is like that. It's an appearance of an angel. And so there's two parallel accounts. There's Zechariah in the temple, who the, the angel Gabriel appears to him and gives him a message of a miraculous uh, conception that's to take place of John the Baptist, uh, who will be the forerunner. Right? And he doubts, and he's struck mute. You can't speak for nine months. How silent the house must have been, right? Um, but of course, as uh, James says, the perfect man does not sin by speech. So we at least know that he was sinless uh, during that, that time. Um, so uh, a little uh, uh, husband joke. You know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, after right after that, you have the, um, the appearance of Gabriel to Our Lady and there's the dialogue between them. And she questions the angel. And we may be thinking, well, why is she not um, struck silent too? And that is because there's a difference, a difference of an interior disposition, right? She believes. And of course, that's what Elizabeth says of her when she goes and greets her, in, um, when she goes to visit her after the uh, uh, conception of Christ, which we call the incarnation after Christ becomes incarnate in her womb, and she goes to visit Elizabeth, she said she hears her voice, and Elizabeth utters this great cry, this loud cry. Her whole house had been filled with silence, right, um, because of Zechariah not speaking. And then she hears the voice of Our Lady, and the babe leaps in the womb, right. And what does Elizabeth say? Elizabeth says, "Blessed are, is she who believed that what would be what would be spoken of the Lord would be fulfilled." So there's a difference between Mary and Zechariah uh, there. But also another key difference is how the angel uh, greets her. You see him greeting her, uh, hail, full of grace. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this when we, we talk about her, her purity. But you can see that when he comes to her, it's different from how he comes to Zechariah. He comes to Mary as one who um, visits his queen. She outranks him in the celestial choirs, right? And we see this in the liturgy. Higher than, in honor than the cherubim, more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim, right? So uh, she, from all eternity, is destined to be the mother of God, and Gabriel knows this. That's what he's come to tell her, right? And so he's the joyous... Um, and um, he's the joyous messenger, that's what angel means. So, uh, 
Now, in the, in the other scriptures, uh, in the Gospel of John, even though we don't have the infancy narratives, we have the wedding at Cana, where uh, Mary and Jesus are there, and Mary asks for more wine, right? Uh, and that's when Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. We'll talk a bit more about that in the fourth session. And we see her also at the foot of the cross. And then, of course, uh, in the book of Revelation, the heavens are opened up, and what appears? But the Ark of the Covenant, right? And so, um, remember in the Ark of the Covenant, in the Old Testament, this was the, uh, the, the gold, perhaps you've seen Indiana Jones, right, uh, and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. But they did a good job making a replica uh, in that movie, but it, it's a, a gold box with the, the mercy seat with the, the cherubim on the top, and in the Ark of the Covenant were the, the uh, tablets of the law uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the manna and the rod of Aaron. And so it, the, the ark was understood to be the place of the divine dwelling presence. And so there she is, uh, this lost ark, right? That's what the whole movie's about, is that the ark has been lost. Well, Mary now is the new ark of the covenant uh, in glory in heaven. But there, uh, touching upon our theme, we see that she is the mother of all who believe, right? She's the mother of all who believe. Uh, in Acts, we have this one appearance of Mary where the church is gathered around her. And of course, we have this one mention of Paul, in St. Paul's letter to the Galatians that when the fullness of time had come, God sent his uh, son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those under the law. So, um, a, a little bit, um, one, one of the things that we notice when we evangelize, when we share the good news about Our Lady, uh, is that sometimes there's a hesitancy to call her mother, right? She's not my mother. Um, you know, I'm a disciple, I love Jesus, but, you know, this Marian devotion, you know, that where's that in the gospel, right? So, but let's think about how we interpret the Bible. When Jesus says, let the children come to me, Who's he speaking to? Just in the context of that scripture. Who's he speaking to? The apostles. the apostles, right? But how do we interpret this today? Literally. Right. Uh, what, what does let the little children come to me look like in our church? Can they come under the gospel? Sir? They, they go up for the gospel? They go up for communion to receive him, right? Uh, baptism. So we understand this more broadly than just something that he spoke once to the apostles. What about when he says, do this in memory of me? Who was he speaking to? The apostles. The apostles. But what does that look like today? The, it's the liturgy, right? The, the uh, uh, Buddha Michel. Uh, makes the offering and uh, and the bread becomes the body and blood of our Lord and Savior. Mary says, "Do the do whatever He tells you." In, in Cana, who knows the story? Who who is she speaking to? The the, the service. The service. But we understand that to mean whatever the Lord asks us to do. We should be his disciple. We should do it, right? Well, now let's think about when Jesus says on the cross, Behold your mother. Who is he speaking to? John. And then, now that, that's where the, we hit the brakes, right? And that, Well, not we, but uh, people often hit the brakes and say, Well, no, he's just executing his last will and testament. He's not actually speaking to me now, is he? But he is, right? And that's what Marian devotion is all about. In Marian devotion, we see her as our mother. We see that when he says, behold your mother, that he who is God, though his word coming out of his mouth, actually accomplishes, it affects what he sends it out to do. So he actually adopts us into his, uh, in, into, as, as brothers. 
in his mother. So she really is our mother there at the foot of the cross. And this is really important for all Christians to understand and embrace that this isn't just a historical note. John doesn't put it in the gospel because he wants to show that Jesus is, is you know, being a good son and, and, and executing his last will and testament effectively. No, when he says this to the beloved disciple, whenever you're reading the Gospel of John, it says beloved disciple, he wants you to think about yourself as the beloved disciple. So he's giving Mary to the beloved disciples and saying, behold your mother. You get it, right? So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the doctrine, theotokos. Um, sometimes this word can seem a little bit uh, strange to us, but it's not very difficult. Theos, of course, means God. We know that, theophany. Um, and tokos comes from the Greek word uh, tiktain, which means to bear. So theotokos is a God-bearer. Now, uh, some of our separated brethren will, uh, will sometimes say that the church invented this term or that uh, St. Cyril invented this term in the fifth century. Uh, because they want to distance it from the earliest church. They want it to look like it's something that's like a Catholic invention. But it's actually very, very old. It's much older than St. Cyril. In fact, the only reason that there was a controversy over the term is because Nestorius wasn't sure that he liked that term being used liturgically. right? And so it pre-exists uh, the Council of Ephesus, in uh, 431, it pre-exists our liturgy. Uh, it uh, even pre-exists the Council of Nicaea in 325. So we see it already in the third century. And if we see it in the third century, it's likely that it probably predates that as well. So there's uh, the, the oldest prayer that we have um, an artifact of it, to Our Lady is the Subtuum Presidium. And uh, it means, under your compassion, we seek refuge, O Theotokos. So there you see, in the Greek, Theotoke. <clears throat> so it's Theotoke because it's uh, uh, in the vocative case, right? So under your compassion, we seek refuge, O Theotokos. Do not disregard our supplications in a difficult time, but rescue us from dangers, O only pure, only blessed one. So, back to the Council of Ephesus and what led up to it, uh, Nestorius, who was a priest in Constantinople, uh, was, was elevated to become a bishop uh, by the Emperor uh, Theodosius II, and, and the emperor had bypassed some local candidates, and uh, so there was a little bit of controversy there as well. And so, at Easter time, uh, there was a controversy. He sent a letter to his priests saying that Mary could only be called the Christotokos, right? What, what do you think? If Theotokos means God bearer, what does Christotokos mean? Christ bearer. Christ bearer, right? So he thinks that to call her God bearer is a little bit too far. So Cyril, uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria, who uh, I believe I, we talked about him last year, uh, but he. Uh, he's a father of the church, and he wrote a number of letters to Nestorius to try to change his mind. And uh, it, it got very polemical, uh, and there was a lot of conflict over, over this issue. And conflict in the church sometimes can be a very good thing. Uh, it was in this case, uh, and he was backed by the Pope. And then at the uh, 431, this is the third ecumenical council. Uh, after Nicaea in 325, and then Constantinople I in 381, then comes Nicaea in 431. And so at this council, uh, Nestorius was deposed as the Archbishop of Constantinople. Uh, and he, he, the emperor also eventually came around uh, to condemn his works. So the uh, the, the, the council enshrined in, in dogma, 
that Mary is the Theotokos, that she is the mother of God. We don't have to have any reservations about calling her mother of God because we are not saying that she pre-exists God. We are not saying that she is the mother of the divine nature. But the whole problem centered around um, the fact that mothers are not mothers of nature, they're mothers of persons, right? And Jesus is God, and Mary is his mother. Therefore, Mary is the mother of God. She's his greatest creature, right? She's not God herself. She's her, his most glorious creature, uh, higher in honor than the cherubim, more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. Right? So this is the basic th uh, theological syllogism. Uh, syllogism is a kind of a, a logical proof. Just remember, Mary is the mother of Jesus. Jesus is God. Therefore, Mary is the mother of God. So just some basic apologetics for you to use in your conversations with others. And after uh, the council was over, uh, the people were said to have cried out, Hagia Maria Theotoke, or Holy Mary, Mother of God. Now, um, a little bit of uh, uh, iconography, you probably know all this stuff already, um, but uh, Mater Theu, it stands for uh, the, 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 this looks like MP, but it's uh, Mu Rho, and then Theta Upsilon. It stands for Mother of God, so it's shortened, uh, condensed, that she is the Mother of God. If you look at your right, you can see what he's talking about, the big icon there. Oh, wow. yeah, the same. Yeah. So that's why when you see it, the icon, that's the same. Mother of God. Yes, thank you for uh, pointing that, that out, Abuna. Uh, I, uh, how am I doing on time, by the way? Am I okay? Don't worry about it. Yes, so I mean, the, he, he, everything about our iconography proclaims this mystery. You know, that she's wider than the heavens. He uh, Pagetera ton uranon. She's greater than the heavens. The heavens are created, so is she. But she, in a way, is greater. I love how the Akathis put it uh, in the, um, I believe it was the eighth, uh, let me find it. I was using two books. A, um, a little piece of paper taped, and it must have fallen off. Ah, there it is. Okay. Um, yes, so uh, the, the, the Akathist even sees in the mysteries in the Old Testament, Mary's motherhood foreshadowed, for example, in the uh, um, um, the, the three youths who were in the furnace and were preserved from the fires that should have consumed them. Well, Mary had within her womb the all-consuming fire of the divinity, and she was not consumed. It's kind of it, it, an interesting way to think about this is when we receive the, the sacred mysteries and, and we receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, it is by his grace that he hides from our vision what uh, divine realities we really are approaching because we couldn't stand it. We, it. we would be overwhelmed by the light and the brightness of the divine glory. Same thing with our, with our Lady, that she contains the one who cannot be contained. Uh, same thing with the burning bush. This is why um, we have an icon of Mary as the burning bush. She is depicted in this way because the, the fire of divinity does not consume her created nature. Thank you for uh, finding that for me.
another couple of, uh, of things to look at in the this. An archangel was sent from heaven to say to the mother of God, Hail, seeing thee, O Lord, taking the human flesh, he was terrified and stood before her crying with bodily, bodiless voice, Hail, thou through whom the joy shall shine forth. Hail that thou that bearest the bearer of all. So here, again, the angel, and any time you have an angel offering in scripture, uh, the, the roles are reversed. The human, the prophet, is terrified, right? But here, uh, the, um, the, the uh, hymnographer has purposely reversed those roles to signify that the angel uh, recognizes something greater in her. And then, of course, in the divine liturgy, it is truly right to call you blessed, O Theotokos. You are ever blessed and all blameless, and the mother of our God, higher in honor than the cherubim, and more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. You gave birth to God the word in virginity. You are truly mother of God. You do we exalt. So we'll talk about the virginity next time. Um, but some just key takeaways here. It's her divine maternity, her uh, being mother of God, that makes her higher than all creation, makes her more glorious. And it's the source from, all, from which all of her other privileges flow. So when we talk about her perpetual virginity uh, and some of the challenges that might come up in thinking about that mystery um, it, or the uh, assumption, her, her uh, assumption of body and soul at her falling asleep, uh, that everything comes from the fact that she is the mother of God. And as we honor our own, uh, our own mothers and, and fathers in, in this life, how much more would God honor his mother? Right? And so another thing to keep in mind, a key principle uh, that w we often talk about in the seminary, I, I teach at the Sacred Heart uh, Major Seminary, our of Detroit, a key uh, thing that we talk about is lex orandi, lex credendi. Lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of prayer is the law of belief. So Nestorius comes along and he starts saying, no, we can't call Mary the Theotokos. This was, you know, she's not the mother of the divine nature. Well, he's overruled, of course, by how Christians have always understood this, that that she uh, truly is the mother of God. And so you can't have some newcomer uh, to, to come upon the scene and overturn the, the, the tables doctrinally and, uh, and, and upset the worship that, uh, that the Christians are already doing faithfully. So uh, as we close up our, our uh, session tonight, what do you think just some questions for you to think about, maybe take home with you, or maybe you have some thoughts now. Uh, what do you think that the teaching of Mary as mother, God, mother of God says about who Christ is? That's one question for you to think about and pray about. And then secondly, and this is a really important for you, a uh, question for you, how can Mary's divine maternity draw you closer to her? So... Thank you for your good attention tonight, and if you have any questions or uh, thoughts, um, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, um, raise your hand. Or so, thank you. Thank you.